nutrient cycling in lakes and streams, linking bio, uh, bio geochemical processes with water quality. In 2016, she was awarded a Global Health Institute seed grant. And the goal of these is really to launch people who are, you know, kind of on the edge of taking their work to the next level, just giving them that edge um, with the Global Health Institute support. And so um, it, this grant supported her investigation into the interrelationships between nutrient loading from wastewater and agricultural runoff and um, thinking about toxins and um, cyanobacteria in Africa's Lake Victoria. So the effects of compromised water quality, and we know about this just from what we hear in the Midwest, so this is not only an African phenomenon, um, uh, are, are both ecological and their health and their economic, they disproportionately impact women. And Corman's study also looks at how women's initiatives can min minimize the health risks of living near um, the lake or lakes. She got her degree, her doctoral degree at Arizona State University, rather than UW Madison, but look, things worked out anyway. And um, she will be, she's, um, she'll be starting, oh, congratulations, she'll be starting her position as an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska in December. Um, so anyway, this is, this is why we're lucky that we have you here today while we can. And then I, before we go into the talk, there's two things I want you to mark on your calendars. On October 19th, we'll be celebrating our, our global health uh, programs and education programs, and I believe that's into Joe Paul. And then we have a really wonderful global health symposium every year for 12 or 13 years now. And this year, it's going to be on August 10th. No, and April 10th. April 10th, <laughs> April 10th, don't come in August, we're too late. April 10th, and we're going to be featuring the work of Susan Paskowitz. Many of you know her. She's been a faculty member here for many years. And she, um, this last year, was awarded a very large grant to look at the relationship. It's kind of a One Health type talk where she looks at um, the, the relationships between um, particularly you know, focusing on malaria and Zika and other uh, vector-borne diseases. And she's, a, she's developing a, um, an ed education program associated with that. She's mentored many students in our Global Health Certificate Program. She's a phenomenal mentor, not only the technical part, but when it's Susan's students, it's like she's checked all the details of where they're staying and who their partner is and you know, whether they're going to be safe and cared for. So she's a full-service uh, Global Health Advisor. So please mark your calendars for April 10th to join us in uh, celebrating Susan and her work. And with that, I will turn it over to Jessica Corman. And please feel free to share anything that I may have um, missed that you would like uh, the audience to know. Thank you. Um, well, thank you all for coming today. I am really excited to uh, give this talk to such a diverse audience. Um, but before I get started, I do want to thank um, two folks, uh, two of my co-authors, Amber Ragnar and Zachary Ogari, who have helped tremendously with the project. Amber is my co-PI. And Zachary is our in-country project manager, and um, really, without him, a lot of this work would not have happened. And of course, I want to thank the Global Health Institute for really buying into this project and funding it. Um, it really would not have been done without the Global Health Institute. We're trying to really make connections between the social sciences and the ecological sciences, and finding uh, funding support at that intersection can be really difficult. Um, so the Global Health Institute is really progressive um, in their ability to fund such you know, transdisciplinary work. So I thank you for that. Um, and the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee actually helped out with a lot of our toxin analysis. Um, they donated a lot of their time and resources, so I want to thank them. And of course, the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute in Kenya, who was our main in-country collaborator and hosted us um, every time we were in Kenya working on this project. So um, Lake Victoria is here right in the equator in East Africa. And as a limnologist, I get really excited about the lake because it's the largest tropical lake. Um, its surface area is between that um, of, between size of Lake Superior and Lake Michigan. So this is a really, really big lake. It also hosts the world's largest freshwater fishery. Mm -hmm. um, estimates are anywhere between half a million to a million tons per year of fish are extracted from this lake. And that fish ends up not only across East Africa, but in Europe and Australia, 
So it's a huge um, global export of fish from this region and provides a lot of economic um, input into the region, jobs, things like that. But the flip side is that this lake is also a really important drinking water source. So unlike you know here in Madison where our drinking water comes from the groundwater or not, our lake that may or may not be eutrophied or may or may not have a cyanobacteria bloom at any point in time, people here, most of them are getting their drinking water from the lake. So water quality is not only important for the fisheries, but for people actually just drinking <coughs> the water. Uh, so Lake Victoria is also housed in one of the highest growing population regions in Africa. So estimates of population growth rates are between three to six percent. Depending on what you read, you'll see numbers anywhere from 30 to 50 million people living in the watershed. The fact that there's that much of a difference between 30 and 50 million people, I think is a testament to the fact of how quickly the population is changing um, in this region. And so not only is Lake Victoria an important resource now, it's going to continue to be an important resource for more and more people in the future. And the other aspect to put into context sort of the results in the study is that it's also a region with high rates of HIV, malaria is uh, endemic to the region, you have malnutrition in some of the rural communities and elsewhere. And so any of the times that we talk about water quality, it might not be just the fact that people are drinking water that may or may not be contaminated, but people that are already immune compromised <coughs> might be drinking that water. So they may be uniquely susceptible to some of these health risks and concerns. Um, in terms of <laughs> HIV and immunocompensation, um, I've read studies where some of the fishing communities along the shore have rates as high as 20 to 40 percent in the community. So it's certainly a concern. Um, so now a little limnological primer for the folks in the audience um, that may not have thought about nutrients and water quality in a while. We like nutrients in our fields, right? Nitrogen and phosphorus is important in fertilizer, helps us grow crops, get the food that we need to live. Um, but oftentimes those nutrients don't stay in the watershed and they end up in lakes where they can lead to algal blooms. Wastewater is another important source of those nutrients. Again, without proper treatment, wastewater going into a lake can bring more nitrogen and phosphorus, basically fertilize plant growth where we don't want it. Uh, in Lake Victoria, um, the primary sources of nitrogen and phosphorus are the rivers that are flowing into that lake. That those rivers are getting um, usually uh, soil erosion and things from the landscape. So this is primarily, you can think of this as a agricultural source, a nutrient source, but sewage is also um, a big input, particularly of phosphorus into the lake. So here are the three countries that surround Lake Victoria, you have Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. Um, and you can see Kenya is responsible for about a fifth and over a third of the phosphorus going into Lake Victoria, um, which is important because Kenya is actually responsible for only about 6% of the lake surface. So they have a disproportionate impact on the pollutants getting into the lake. Um, and so kind of what happens is that you might see or you might not see the fact that there's actually a lake right here. It's partly because it um, has so much sedimentation from the rivers coming in, a lot of algae growth in the area. Um, so it tends to be a more polluted area, and hence part of the reason that we focus our work in Kenya. Um, so the Wynnum Gulf, again, is about 6% of the lake, 22% of the catchment. It's a drinking water source for Kisumu, which is the third largest city in Kenya, about half a million people in that region, um, and several million more living uh, in the surrounding areas. And there are known water quality risks in the region. Um, to kind of emphasize the differences in water quality even more, these are a couple of photos taken from um, plane trips that I was on. Here is a airplane view of Wenham Gulf where you see that brown water, and these wisps here are the cyanobacterial blooms. You may actually see similar events on Monona and Mendota when you fly over. Same thing here on a bigger scale. Um, and then these darker bands are water hyacinth, which I'll talk about in a little bit, versus on the other side of the lake, the water does tend to be clearer. 
Um, I'm not saying that there aren't issues with the water quality on other parts of the lake, but certainly the issues in Kenya um, are a bit more dire and may be an opportunity to sort of um, think, okay, so if conditions continue, nutrient inputs continue to a greater extent in other parts of the lake, they might be facing a scenario to switch to this sort of system of the lake. So it's kind of a worst case scenario um, and a good place to start where issues are needed or issues are being faced. So issue number one are the cyanobacteria blooms, also known as HAVs or harmful algal bacteria. You've probably seen all of these phrases in the news. Um, for the sake of this talk, you can think of them both synonymously. And the reason we're concerned with the cyanobacteria is that these organisms create what are called cyanotoxins. Those compounds can be neurotoxins, hepatotoxins, cytotoxins, and there can be other irritants. We're not really sure why cyanobacteria create these compounds. There's lots of different hypotheses out there that have varying support, but simply speaking, they're exudates from the cells, they're extra material that the um, cells release into the water column. They can also be inside the cells and have detrimental effects to humans and animals. Um, those effects range from liver and kidney damage, um, a lot of stomach issues, muscle pain, fever, um, skin issues are very common. If you are near these lakes and breathing in that water, sometimes you don't feel well, you get sort of a respiratory distress. And there have been livestock um, and pet death probably once a summer, so you probably hear about a dog that swam in an unhealthy lake in the region in the Midwest um, and died that could have been caused by cyanotoxins um, in the area. Um, exposure routes can be through swimming, which is why you see beach closures in Mendota often um, in the summertime in other lakes in the area, but also through breathing and again through drinking water consumption. Um, and really quite tragically and part of one of the reasons that we started to pay attention to cyanotoxins in the health community was in the 90s where in Brazil um, they were using lake water that had um, a cyanobacteria bloom and there were cyanotoxins in the water and using that water untreated in hemodialysis. You had liver failure in about 100 people. Um, really quite tragic. And the other perhaps unexpected thing about these cyanotoxins is that when you boil water, which is a really common method to cleaning up your water, you actually concentrate the cyanotoxins not getting rid of them. So um, there may or may not be sort of that educational threshold to get over when you think about how to properly treat the water. So in Lake Victoria, we've looked at the correlation between um, the cyanobacteria biomass and microcystin, which is a very common cyanotoxin. Um, and we do see a fairly good relationship between chlorophyll A and the cyanotoxins. It's not perfect, but the general idea is the more cyanotoxin you have, or the more cyanobacteria you have in the water, most likely the more cyanotoxins that they're producing, um, and the greater concern that that water could be in terms of drinking water quality. Um, we've also done some preliminary surveys, again, just sort of uh, mapping out the water quality in the region. So here is um, a simple figure of uh, zoomed into that Gulf area. Here are some of our sampling sites. This is the city. Um, and the size of the circles relates to the size of the microcystin or the cyanotoxin in the water. Um, and what might immediately jump out is that there's not necessarily a really big spatial pattern. Um, levels of concern, this is the Miller level is kind of a modest level at which you don't want kids drinking the water, but they probably have unique um, or uh, lower susceptibility, higher susceptibility to lower levels and the World Health Organization standards. Um, so anything that's orange or red probably should not be drank because of those cyanotoxin levels. Um, and it's, you know, almost every single site in the lake has those levels, which is, of course, a concern. So when we think about drinking water interventions, we came into this project, well, especially I came into this project as a limnologist, thinking about the watershed, how does that deal with lake water health, and where can we go from there? And so in Kenya, um, as I mentioned, Lake Victoria is an important food and water source for 
40 plus million people, but the lake water is compromised, we know this. So clean up the lake by, of course, you know, stopping the nitrogen and phosphorus flows into that lake. Um, but that watershed management takes a lot of political will. Lake Victoria, you might need to think about getting Uganda and Tanzania involved as well. So you have three countries that you have to get to work together to say, we're gonna cut down on fertilizers, we're gonna cut, we're gonna improve our treat, uh, wastewater treatment. There are several industries um, along the lake. It's a big flower production area. Coca-Cola has a huge plant along the lake shore. Um, as a random aside, it's the Coca-Cola has an inflow pipe and an outflow pipe really close together in the lake, and that's almost always the worst water quality in the region, which is really sad. Um, so hopefully they have some really great treatment. But anyway, um, if you think of the states too, we were thinking a lot about water quality in the US and we're struggling with these same issues. How do you get um, water quality improvements, keeping the nutrients on the landscape? But there's some unique issues with Lake Victoria. One, you have increased population growth. You also have a growing middle class in Kenya. Um, both of those things could mean that the watershed influence you know, is increasing just by the strict number of people but also demands of those people on resources from the lakes could be increasing too. Um, and you have a legacy of poor water quality. The lake has seen, has people think, most people think it's been eutrophic since about the 1980s. And so you have a buildup of nutrients in the lake, particularly in the sediments, that even if you shut off all of the nutrient flows from the watershed, probably still gonna see nutrients fertilize in the cyanobacteria in that water column for years to come. Um, and then the uh, sort of the third major thing is that in climate change in these temperate systems, warming temperatures favor cyanobacteria. So even if you clean up the water, you might have to get to an even lower threshold, a lower amount of nutrients in there before the cyanobacteria will stop to grow. So it seems like a pretty dire situation um, in terms of thinking about how to clean up Lake Victoria. But in terms of drinking water, there are other places kind of along the pipeline of getting the lake, the water from the lake to the water in your glass that might be better options for um, lowering the human health risks associated with this drinking water source. Those can be anything from taking the water from the lake to the public supply, where it's treated and stored in the community, and household level treatments, um, what people do to the water before they actually drink it. And this is where we've tried to focus part of our work, you know, what types of local options might be there for the people, um, and how can some of our ecological knowledge of the lake inform different um, intervention and opportunities. So for the first part of this, um, for the results of the project, I'll be talking about some of the community surveys work where we try to identify um, more broadly what the human health risks are. We came into this project with our assumptions about how people were using the lake water, what they were using it for. Um, and so we actually went out to the communities to see what was happening to then further inform um, possible opportunities to improve uh, the drinking water quality and lower health risks. <coughs> so to do that, we picked seven shoreline communities in the area, interviewed 50 men and women in each of those communities, also um, held some focus group discussions. Uh, those data aren't yet available, they're still being translated. Uh, but the other thing we did want to point out is that we were able to partner with a local NGO in the region and they conducted the interviews for us, uh, which was great because they were people from the community, able to do the interviews in Luo, the local language. Um, and I think it made for a um, more robust interview experience. Um, our communities are surrounded um, on both sides of the Lake of Kisumu, spread out a bit, and some of them do match up to where we have water quality data, which will be great going forward and making connections between the two. So our communities, um, most of them are reliant on fisheries for their household incomes, but there also are different sources of um, money in the area, which kind of is lends to a good sign, right? So if there is concern in Lake Victoria that the fisheries will eventually collapse because of the 
water quality issues, and some people have already started to diversify what they're doing for their income. So in terms of robustness of the community, that's a big thing. Um, I was also surprised that only you know less than half of the households are getting their drinking water just from the lake. It's like, wow, this is good. People are recognizing that there are perhaps problems with the lake water, and they're able to go to different areas. But the range is quite different. Um, some of the communities, pretty much everyone is getting their drinking water from the lake versus other communities um, are not. The community where only 16% of the people are getting their water directly from the lake, that's because um, another group came in and built a rainwater collector in that area. So they had an influx of a bit of money to um, give them a different source of water. So when um, we found out that people weren't getting entirely all their lake water, or drinking water from the lake, we ask them where else they might be going. Some of those things are good, right? They have rainwater, they're able to drill in holes or bore wells and get in the groundwater source, presumably cleaner sources of water. But the survey also identified that some people are getting their drinking water from the rivers and fish ponds, which may be even worse in terms of water quality than the lake. Um, so something to think about as we go forward. And then we asked the communities how they were already treating their water um, most every household had a household level treatment except for about 6% and most of the households were using multiple treatments, which is really great. Um, treatments that were common were using chlorine or aquaguard, basically chemical treatments to kill the cells in your lake water sample. Um, a number of households are also using filtration. The filtration usually though was a cloth filtration. So really just removing the particulates from the water, not necessarily removing cells. Um, and then we do have people using boiling or aeration. In terms of what this means for the cyanotoxins, um, unfortunately, we've done some preliminary tests looking at the efficacy of chlorine now in Lake Victoria, and it's been replicated elsewhere too, is that when you add chlorine to water where there are cells, you lyse those cells and any cyanotoxins that are in the cells suddenly are in the drinking water and actually can be worse in terms of water quality. Um, so it adds a point of um, where some uh, education needs to happen in terms of that. Um, so moving forward, we also ask people other uses of the lake water, um, a number of the households are using it to wash their clothes and also collect plants from the lakes. And when we ask people who were doing these things, you know, it's women and children are the ones that are on the shoreline getting the drinking water, cleaning, washing dishes, washing clothes. Um, and so there are concerns with sort of unique susceptibilities with women in the community versus the men in the community who are the ones that are going out in the fishery boats and children in particular going in and um, perhaps getting high exposure rates to what might be unhealthy um, water conditions. So um, we also asked people what they thought was causing the bloom. Um, and in this slide I have the answers. The relative size of the box relates to the relative number of people that thought those things. Um, so we have things like lake condition, water plants, natural causes, sort of intrinsic properties of the lake. Um, more than half the people think it's just sort of a consequence of what's happening in the lake that's causing those algal blooms. Um, so I was really quite surprised that we have a number of people that think the water plants are causing the blooms. Um, and fortunately there are, you know, a minority, but still um, a significant number of people recognize the fact that um, industry and agriculture, sort of those pollutants, those runoffs, those plastic things that move nitrogen and phosphorus into the landscape are responsible for the blooms, um, which in terms of having an educated public that can push their politicians into you know, going after those long-term changes, it's great that people are recognizing that. Um, but it certainly points out to us as scientists that you know, there's more education that needs to happen in these communities about their natural resource. Um, and for the Invita, that is, um, it's a causeway in the lake that's currently blocking off a little bit of the flow from um, the Wynnum Gulf and the rest of the lake. Um, and so the idea 
there is Kenya, the government is getting rid of that causeway, and some people think that will help flush out the Gulf. It probably won't. Hydrological models suggest it's not quite big enough to make that much of a difference. Um, but I thought it was quite interesting that you know some people came up with that as you know part of the reason that um, the blooms are happening. Uh, another question we asked: Do you have any specific concerns related to the water? This question was geared towards the women. Um, and again, you see a lot of people recognizing that there are issues with the water, it's dirty, poor quality, um, there are problems there, germs, it's polluted, um, people don't like it for hyacinth, it's too green. So again, at least um, in these communities, people are cognizant of the fact that there are some issues with the water quality, even if they don't know quite um, what to do about it in terms of their human health. So just to kind of summarize what we found here, um, the lake, you know, again, is a diverse resource, providing jobs, drinking water, um, and clean water for people in the area, and that we have sort of unique gender-based susceptibilities to water quality with women and children interacting with the shorelines, um, but that there are some opportunities to do some education on, you know, what's causing this bloom, and what does that mean for the long-term sustainability of those communities. Um, so that kind of wraps up the community survey portion, and now I will jump into the ecological experiment that we conducted. And so here we wanted to look at the interactions between water hyacinth, the plant that's um, invaded much of the lake, and water quality. So water hyacinth, um, here we have a picture of what can happen when the water hyacinth moves in to the lake. So this is the same bay. Um, there's the tree for reference, and just based on the date, either it looks like a field of plants or it looks like a lake. Does it cycle or once it's like that, it's? It cycles, yep. So water hyacinth um, is, has a floating rooting structure. And so the winds can blow it from one side of the lake to the other, um, which is why you get that um, transient appearance of it in the lake. Um, it's really took off on the 1990s across the entire lake. Right now it's pretty much focused just in uh, Wynnum Gulf, the high densities. Um, and weevils, which are these little insect things, were credited for reducing the population. They get the credit for it. I'm not sure if that's what actually happened. Um, I think an invasive biologist might have different ideas as to what happened. But there are concerns that what we see in Wynnum Gulf um, with these high densities coming back is um, a premonition to what's going to happen to the rest of the lake and that these concerns will resurface. Um, there are a lot of concerns with water hyacinth. It's really fast growing. It can double its population um, size every five to 15 days, about every two weeks in warm temperatures, between 20, like 20 and 25 degrees Celsius, which in a tropical lake, those temperatures are about year round. So really fast growing species. Um, and as you might imagine, seeing these pictures of the water hyacinth, you can choke boat navigation. Um, in the 90s, when we had the worst sort of coverage of water hyacinth, 70% decline in economic activities because the fishermen could not get out into the lake. Um, when I was there on my last trip and they were getting these blooms back, the fishermen was, were saying that they really had to watch the winds closely because if they didn't get, so if the bay was open in the morning, they could take, or in the evening when they were taking the boat out, um, they had to watch the winds in the morning to make sure they could get back in before the water hyacinth did, because if the water hyacinth got there first, they're stuck in the middle of the lake. Um, so certainly a concern. There are also concerns that um, schistosomiasis and malaria, so the snails that carry schistos and the mosquitoes, um, like to live near the water hyacinth. Um, so there might be this alternative sort of human health aspect that we largely ignore in our study, but I just want to point it out here. Um, and that when you have these clumps of water hyacinth, you tend to decrease oxygen levels in your water, leading to anoxia, which is not good for fish. Um, some of the benefits, there are a couple scientists that think it might pro actually provide habitat for fish. So as long as you don't get to those anoxic levels, it could be good for young fish. Um, 
but sort of uh, remains to be seen and under what conditions. Here's just another picture of the water high, some kind of floating in, and you see some of the canals that can be created in the lake. Um, and this is a, you know, this is a common view of what the lake shore will look like when water highs have, have been. Um, so in terms of the interaction between water hyacinth and water quality, um, one, there could be some sort of, some unexpected relationships between the two. One is you can see the sort of clumping of the cyanobacteria with the water hyacinth. And if this is actually happening, then you might think if you're collecting drinking water from the shoreline and there's a bunch of water hyacinth there, you might wanna try to avoid it, right? Because you're getting, you know, perhaps, um, localized increased rates of cyanobacteria, which we know are related to higher cyanotoxin levels. However, there's been some laboratory work that suggests that water hyacinth can actually either outcompete the cyanobacteria by taking up like nutrients, or actually removing some of the toxins in the water or breaking those toxins down. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this work up until this point hadn't been done at the lake scale. <coughs> and so that was one of our big um, our second component of our project is to understand, well, what our high is not sure, it has all of these really bad aspects to it, but it's there in the lake, it's not going away. Are there potential benefits or consequences um, or worse aspects to it than what we might expect? Um, and so we set out to say, okay, if we um, change the variation or change the level of water hyacinth in the lake, what does that mean for water quality? Do we see those kind of good benefits that we've seen in some of the lit studies? Or do we get you know, that clumping effect and actual worsening in water quality? So we set a pilot experiment where we built these floating cages. Um, we involved one of the uh, shoreline communities to help us um, launch the experiment and monitor it. Um, and we looked at, based on those differing levels of water hyacinth, a number of different water quality indicators. Um, we monitored those cages for about four weeks. And um, as I sort of suggested with the lake, you have conditions of either low water hyacinth or high water hyacinth. And there are also, the lake is not blooming constantly. Um, depending on various conditions, it will either be in a bloom, bloom or non-bloom condition. Um, ideally, we wanted to run this experiment, one where we'd be adding water hyacinth into the lake and the second where we'd be removing water hyacinth and see if it does mediate water quality, improve water quality. But as what happens with natural experiments, um, the first time we went out there to do the work, there were no water hyacinth in the bay, and there wasn't bloom. Good for the people, not great for the science, but it gave us a nice sort of baseline of what was happening. And then um, when we went back there, the second time, um, we did have the high water hyacinth um, but again, the lake wasn't entirely blooming. The lake is blooming right now. We have a third iteration of the experiment running right now. Um, so I don't have those data because they're still being collected, but um, that'll add a bit more to the study as we go forward. So just to kind of get a picture of what we had. So we had four cages with um, no water hyacinth, with very small amounts, and then about sort of normal densities and then double densities there and we use that as a, um, a way to make a comparison with water quality using regression. And so the first time we did this experiment, we pretty much had to add water hyacinth there. Um, and I was pretty excited because when we saw, you know, what few floating mats of water hyacinth we saw were about the size of our experimental cages. So I felt pretty confident that we were replicating the natural environment. Um, and in terms of some of the variables that did show a response, the responses weren't huge, right? So here's dissolved inorganic nitrogen, total dissolved solids, um, the silica in the water, and really not much is going on here. There was not an effect of water hyacinth additions to water quality. Um, we looked at some other variables, and again, and um, the variables that we looked at, there was no effect of adding water hyacinth to the lake. So it doesn't really support or review either of the hypotheses we saw. Um, and in terms of scaling this up to drinking water collection recommendations, sort of suggests it doesn't matter. However, the story changes when the water hyacinths are present. So we again did the experiment where we actually um, had to do a removal. So we set those cages up and took the water hyacinths out. 
Um, here's one of my community partners going in there and helping us basically create a path into the water so we could set up our experiments. Um, and here we see some really cool things, right? So this is about the point of the densities of the water hyacinth um, at the time of the experiment. And this is removing the water hyacinth. So when we remove the water hyacinth when it's present, we get increased oxygen levels in the water, which makes a lot of sense. Suddenly, you know, this, um, the reports of low oxygen levels with water hyacinth, we move the water hyacinth, the oxygen comes back in the water, that's a good thing. Um, we also see lowering of coli counts and coliform counts when we remove the water hyacinth. So this is really cool, right? It suggests that when your bay, your shoreline is covered with water hyacinth, if you can get in there and create a cage from which you can extract your drinking water, you might do a decent job of lowering E. coli levels um, you know, by half or more, and coliform levels by you know, half or more, without even worrying about water treatment methods on the household end. Um, so preliminary results, but really, really cool. Um, and we also saw, with total phosphorus, we also saw a decrease in total phosphorus levels. Um, there are different ideas to the mechanism behind it, but um, with repeated experiments in different places, we can hopefully get at some of those. But it's a pretty exciting preliminary result um, with uh, drinking water implications. We um, have the cyanotoxin sample that we'll be analyzing next, but we expect that they'll follow the same trends that we see some of these other water quality indicators. Um, the lack of effect that we saw on chlorophyll A um, is largely, I think, attributed to the fact that um, the water hyacinth was just completely covering the lake, so might not be a lot of cytobacteria to begin with, which would suggest that maybe the cyanotoxins um, won't be effective, but we'll see. Anyway, in terms of the E. coli and the coliform, it's a really good sign. Um, so just to sort of summarize, we didn't see strong influences of water hyacinth um, additions when they weren't there, but when we removed them, we did see an improvement in water quality, suggesting that some of that lab work is scaling up to the lake scale. So going back to our drinking water intervention options and kind of summarizing the work that we found through both of those components. One, there's a lot of work to be done with nitrogen and phosphorus management in the watershed. Um, we're probably not gonna be able to do much in our project, but hopefully we can at least get um, education out there and let folks know that you know, um, thinking when they think about water quality in their lake, not to think just about what's happening in the lake, but what also is happening in the watershed. Um, two, for our collection optimization, so this is where the water hyacinth results come into play, and this is where we'll be working with women groups in particular to um, get at some of these options and incorporate them into what they're doing. And then three, um, the treatment methods employed. So the good news is that people are using treatment methods. The bad news is that they may not be the best treatment methods. But with recommendations, hopefully we can get at that. And then our work also um, has uncovered a couple things that we hadn't thought about before. One is that some of these communities are using alternative water sources. So are those water sources safe? Are they not safe? And what does that mean for um, susceptibilities to different water quality issues? Two, um, the communities are different, right? So when we go into the community that's you know, only getting 16% of their lake water from the lake, the recommendations there for human health might be completely different and should be completely different than the communities that are relying solely on the lake water for their drinking water. Um, and then the efficacy of treatment. I mentioned that um, using chlorination but it could actually be bad for drinking water. Um, and so tapping into that a bit more so that we can make good recommendations on how households can be at the household level um, treating their water to lower their risks. Um, so also want to point out when we think about drinking water, um, it's one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, number six, share availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Um, it is a global concern and so hoping that some of the insights that we've gotten from this project can be expanded elsewhere 
And as you mentioned at the start, which is a, a great setup for my final slide, is that this is also very much a local issue too. Um, here's a picture from the really bad algal bloom in Lake Erie um, in 2014 that um, you can see, you know, just a piece of green waters where Toledo lost its drinking water supply um, for a bit. And so, yeah, um, lots to think about with water quality and lake health. So thanks again to the Soma Beach community that helped us set up the experiment. You know, Cameron kept um, the Kempfrey staff and students that also helped us out. Here's a picture of some of them um, collecting samples in the field and helping us transport the cages. And then Zachary Quenna is our social scientist with the Kenny Marine Medical Research Institute who's helping um, do the translations with the surveys. And I am happy to take any questions. So this might be a really naive question, but is there any way, given that you can create these spaces where the kayaking is almost like filtering, mm -hmm. is there any way that you could do some kind of patchwork farming to use the hyacinth for like biogas or something? Yeah, so um, I met a guy from the Netherlands who is looking at economic opportunities with water hyacinth and trying to bring some money in from Europe to the communities so that they can harvest the hyacinth for something. Um, for something. Yeah, a lot of it, um, probably one of the coolest things was turning it into bricks. Oh. So some people are already using it um, as a fiber source, but um, yeah, turning it into yeah. bricks and a housing material. I think it's for clothes and sort of like basket weaving. Oh, okay. And that type of stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 So this where, what, where does Kisumu get its water? Is it also the lake? Okay. Is there any central treatment? So yes, there is treatment, but still um, nobody drinks it. And if you're using it for, you know, to wash vegetables and plants, you're like the general practice is to add iodine or something to it. And that's so. Um, so it's not in rural versus urban. There's no, there's no difference in how to approach this problem. Right. Other than in some of the. Um, in the rural areas, because people are actually doing the water collection themselves, you know, they can pick where they're going to take the water from the lake, versus Kisumu is taking it from a water intake pipe. Um, and so it's sort of at the whim of whatever parcel of water the, the intake pipe is seeing is going into the city. Um, one of the crazy ideas that we've had kind of launching off of this project are, so all of our community surveys are focused on the rural areas. Um, and asking people in the urban areas these same types of questions about the, you know, what do they think caused the algal blooms? What are they concerned with with the lake? We asked a bunch of questions too on what people thought about the future of the lake um, to see if people that are, you know, in the rural communities and interacting with it like daily um, differ from those in the urban areas where they are removed from the lake itself. Uh, with your community data, are you going to try to tie into any public health data, or is there any incidence of diseases or cyanotoxin reports that you could tie into this? Yeah, so we have um, some access to, like, there are broad public health data that, and those things are like the malnutrition rates, the HIV rates, things like that. Um, we have a grant into NIH right now to get at ones that are more directly related to this project. Um, and that's largely because you have to get different um, IRB approvals to um, generate that data. So the data a lot of times don't exist. Um, we're still sort of understanding how cyanotoxin exposure manifests itself um, in humans. Um, and so that project will get at that in children if it gets funded. Yeah, so um, in a sense, there, there are some good options already out there. Um, one is getting at a better filtration mm -hmm. system to remove the cells. Um, if microfiltration is possible, that's a general recommended practice. And then after that, you add the chlorine in there um, just as sort of a, a double um, thing. There's, yeah, so that would 
be more efficient, better filtration that isn't just using physical plus using smaller actual like, tiny pore filters. I imagine that doesn't do anything for the toxins, right? Except not make them worse. Well, it gets the cell out. Right. That can, and so that should help. And then chlorine, if the cell um, can help remove it, but um, only it's. Yeah, the microfiltration is like it's kind of the best, and it should get at like if it's the pore size is small enough, it should remove it. Yeah. Uh, have you seen the chlorine used as a disinfectant in places like Ethiopia, where, for instance, Lake Tana is the biggest in the largest lake, uh, about uh, I'm not mistaken, sixty thousand. Meter, right? And uh, I'm looking at the report from the 2014 researchers found that one third of it is active in that. And uh, uh, it's almost you know, African land uh, lake. So uh, similarly, the other lakes in Ethiopia, for instance, are doing it from different groups. So as a result of eutrophication, so, uh, what do you think? I mean, could your project extend to those uh, different East African countries as a network so that we can you know, devise uh, a method for looking at that? So, you know, the mushrooms, there were field participants and everybody was uh, from uh, English communities and from uh, sharing experiences. Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, that's such a good point about, there are a lot of projects like ours that are kind of done on a shoestring budget, um, and can, making those connections between the different groups, researchers, NGOs, governmental agencies, um, are so important. Um, along those lines, I was able to go to the Great Lakes Conference, the African Great Lakes Conference in May in Uganda, where I met a bunch of researchers and NGOs and practitioners um, across the region and share some of our knowledge, that kind of thing. But I think there's a lot more that can be done in that regard. Um, it seems, and I'm perhaps being a bit naive here, but it seems a little bit easier to get money for projects than it is to build networks. Um, but it's an important thing to do. Yeah, your point's well taken. I mean, the Global Health Institute has uh, some connections to other universities. So we can expand that kind of connection and link up and work more with uh, other Yep, yep. Any other questions or comments? I think our speaker will be here for a few minutes, but I just want to thank everybody so much for coming, and we hope we'll see you at other um, Global Health Tuesdays. I think the next one is October 31st, um, and uh, we'll.